The next speaker, Dr. Moti, he has been the moderator for AML session, uh, come from uh, France. His topic is a uh, high risk MDS treatment. Dr. Moti, please. Good morning again. Uh, once again, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Simrit, for the kind invitation to this, uh, uh, and Dr. Coleman for this uh, uh, wonderful event that is becoming really a big uh, international hematology event. So for the next few minutes or so, uh, my task is to address the treatment approaches for high-risk MDS. We already heard about the wonderful uh, advances in terms of molecular biology and classification. However, from a transplanter point of view, MDS is still relatively simple. When it comes to low-risk MDS, the uh, main objective of therapy is to improve hematological parameters, and we heard already a very nice talk about the available options. And when it comes to the so-called high-risk uh, MDS, what we would like to do is to modify the natural history of the disease because obviously these patients are going to transform into acute leukemia and survival is usually uh, extremely poor. Uh, for the moment, uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation is the only uh, curative uh, option available for those patients with high-risk MDS. Nevertheless, I will not spend a lot of time uh, convincing you about the problems uh, of uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation, mainly uh, non-relapse mortality, uh, which should be uh, counterbalanced uh, to the potential cure. And this is a very uh, complex procedure with uh, several parameters, and usually it's not very easy to try to uh, get a clear picture about the exact role of allogenic stem cell transplantation in any kind of disease. Another additional problem when it comes to uh, MDS is that there are several limiting factors uh, today. We do not have uh, randomized trials. We do not have a prospective evaluation about the role of chemotherapy. And when uh, we go back to the historical uh, data, uh, these are heterogeneous series. Uh, age, we just heard that uh, in the published series about maloablative stem cell transplantation, age is around 35 years old. That does not reflect the true story of MDS. Usually in the literature, there is a mixed bag of not only MDS, but usually these patients are mixed with secondary uh, AML. And also, if we look to the last 10 years, there have been lots of changes over time with several classifications that makes usually comparison between trials quite difficult. Supportive care is improving, but also there is uh, introduction of novel therapies, especially uh, hypomethylating agent and uh, IMIDs in the 5Q minus syndrome. Despite all of these limitations, you can appreciate that according to the EBMT registry and latest survey, uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation for MDS is a rapidly growing business. There are several reasons to this. Uh, the population is aging. Diagnosis is being done more and more frequently but also allogenic stem cell transplantation results are improving and uh, these days, it's roughly uh, quite easy to find a donor to almost every uh, patient. So going back to the historical uh, data, which in my opinion are not relevant anymore, when we summarize the available literature about the standard maloablative allogenic stem cell transplantation, median age is around 35 years old, whereas the in the real life median age of MDS is around 70. Disease free survival is quite decent. Nevertheless, transplant related mortality is uh, very uh, disappointing. So how to move forward uh, from this? I think there are two major issues. We would like to improve the uh, outcome 
of uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation, namely reducing morbidity and mortality. Obviously, supportive care is continuously uh, improving, and this is uh, good news. We are more and more uh, better selecting uh, donors, but I think the major advances uh, come from the introduction of the so-called reduced intensity but most importantly, reduced toxicity uh, conditioning uh, regimens. The other uh, important feature, it's not only improving uh, the transplant procedure itself, but it's also reducing the risk of relapse after transplant because this is the main cause of failure after transplant. And this is why we need to design some uh, effective prior and post-transplant strategies. So to summarize the era of reduced intensity conditioning, uh, the available literature suggests that the median age is now 55, so 20 years older than the 35 years uh, in the maloablative setting. We are still around 15 years uh, far from the real life age of MDS. Disease-free survival, quite decent, around 50%, but we are still stuck with several reports with heterogeneous disease, different types of donors, usually small series with short follow-up, and one may question the reproducibility of these results. Is allogenic stem cell transplantation a procedure that can be applied to a re elderly MDS patient in my opinion, the answer is yes. This is a recent uh, analysis from EBMT, around 1,400 patients above the age of 50, from 50 to 74, all type of donors and conditioning, and you can simply appreciate that the three years overall survival is similar whether you consider the 50 to 60 uh, age range or over 60. Again, the results comparing RIC versus standard conditioning are also the same. So definitely good news that allogenic stem cell transplant can more and more be applied to elderly patients. Another uh, important and unanswered question in the field of uh, high-risk MDS uh, patients who are candidate to transplant is what kind of cytoreduction is to be used prior to allotransplant? Is this intensive chemotherapy, similar to what we do with AML? Should we broadly use hypomethylating agent instead or any uh, other options? And this is uh, very important, uh, the issue of cytoreduction, because more than uh, 10 years ago, Professor Sierra published this nice paper in Blood showing that the Blast infiltration in the bone marrow before transplant is a very uh, good indicator of outcome after transplant. In another word, you need to decrease the uh, blast infiltration of the marrow prior to proceeding to transplant. What about intensive chemotherapy results? This is from the EBMT registry, unpublished data, a very big number of patients comparing, you know, those patients who were transplanted without chemotherapy with chemotherapy intensive in first complete remission and uh, chemotherapy but without achieving complete remission. To make a long story short, it is likely that you are going to increase the transplant-related mortality rate, and this is quite, I would say, logical whenever you apply uh, intensive chemotherapy prior to transplant. Obviously, we do not have the intention to treat data, but some patients are going to be lost during uh, the intensive chemotherapy without, uh, before proceeding to a transplant. Another very attractive uh, option uh, for uh, cytoreduction prior to transplant is the use of hypomethylating agent. And this is rapidly growing worldwide because it's relatively safe and easy to administer even in elderly patients. Unfortunately, we are still lacking 
prospective data. Uh, we have just published on behalf of the French Society uh, for Transplantation, SFGMTC, our experience using 5-ASA uh, prior to allotransplant in high-risk MDS. Uh, since the paper is published, I'll be quite short about it. To make a long story short, it's clear with all the biases that you have in a registry-based uh, uh, analysis, it's clear that when the goal is to downstage the underlying disease to bridge into transplant, it's clear that 5-ASA could be a valid therapeutic approach in those patients who are eligible to transplant. I'm not saying it's better than other approaches. It's quite uh, acceptable and safe approach in these patients. And if you look to the uh, outcome, to the survival curves, comparing those patients who received 5-ASA uh, cytoreduction versus chemotherapy versus the combination of 5-ASA uh, plus chemotherapy, you can appreciate that the outcome data uh, are uh, quite uh, similar. Once a patient uh, proceed and receive a transplant, one major concern, because this is the main reason for failure after transplant, is the relapse issue. So we need to readdress the issue of post-remission uh, therapy. And there are several options that are currently available. In the first session this morning, we heard a lot about these different options. And uh, I think uh, that pharmacologic maintenance post allo is likely to be the easiest uh, approach to be uh, applied. Uh, and we need to consider several risk factors before trying to design the optimal post-remission approach. Cytogenetic, according to uh, IPSS scoring, is definitely something to bear in mind when designing uh, treatment strategies for these patients, where you can appreciate, unfortunately, that in high-risk cytogenetics, the hazard ratio for relapse after transplant is going to be extremely high. Another parameter to consider is the chromosome 7 abnormalities. And it's not only chromosome 7 abnormalities, it's also more and more the issue of monosomal karyotype. Data is accumulating from different sources, highlighting the uh, negative outcome of those patients with monosomal karyotype. Also, interesting data from Professor Kroger and colleagues in Hamburg about the uh, fibrosis in the bone marrow biopsy prior to transplant. Those patients with severe fibrosis are going to do worse, and this is a good reason to try to uh, apply some effective post-remission therapies. So what are the available options? I will not expand a lot about it. There is some convincing data about the use of uh, as a cytidine after allogenic stem cell transplantation. And there are several arguments from an immunological point of view that makes hypomethylating agent as good agents uh, for maintenance after a therapy. And to make a long story short, it's likely that by using a hypomethylated agent, you can increase the uh, immune graft versus leukemia effect without increasing the risk of GVHD. This is work in progress. It needs to be further established. Nevertheless, it's a good start. And there are several uh, ongoing trials uh, these days in different places testing uh, ASA or decitabin, plus or minus, for example, DLI, or other cellular therapy approaches. This is uh, our ongoing uh, prospective national trial uh, in uh, this setting. And uh, in conclusion, uh, I think it's quite reasonable in uh, these patients to apply and this, uh, the ELN, European Leukemia Network recommendations, which are quite uh, easily uh, uh, applicable in different places worldwide. This has been uh, published uh, 
a few months ago. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I would kindly invite you to the 40th EBMT annual meeting. This is the 40th anniversary. It will take place in Milan. And as part of the uh, educational efforts in collaboration with AFCON, we are organizing also a Maloma meeting in Bangkok in May 11 to 13. All of you are kindly invited to join us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Moti, for your wonderful lecture. The